Oh, this is gonna be a really good video for the comment section. What is the weakest Pokemon of each generation? Look, Pokemon is a game where people get a little weirdly attached to their favorites to the point that they insist that their favorite is competitively viable, despite all evidence pointing to the contrary, instead of just appreciating their design and lore and whatever they can do in an in-game playthrough. Okay, maybe I'm guilty of that, but my Wo Chen body pillow doesn't come in the mail until next Monday, so I still have the right to call people out on this stuff until then. Look, all Pokemon are valid as favorites, but their competitive viability is a pretty objective metric. Some Pokemon are just stronger than others, and while over the generations there's been a noticeable power creep, every generation has its batch of really, really weak Pokemon. So today we'll be identifying which of these Pokemon are the weakest within their respective generational batch. Feel free to argue in the comments, it actually does help out the channel a lot. If you if you enjoyed this video at any point in time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. As a matter of fact, you should really just subscribe right now because of a playlist full of content just like this that you can enjoy once this video ends. And if you think you're subscribed, do me a favor and double check because only like half my viewers actually are. And we're getting really close to 200,000 subscribers. I would really appreciate the help there. With that, let's get into the video. Okay, let's first examine what it means to be a quote, weak Pokemon. We're gonna toss out everything that Karen said before her fight in Generation 2 because she's just like objectively wrong. Truly strong trainers don't win with their favorites. They win. Period. Doesn't matter what they win with, a truly strong trainer can identify what Pokemon are best at accomplishing that goal and putting them on their team with the right partners. Some Pokemon on this team might have lower stats than others, but they can make up for it by having a specific niche role on the team, having access to important moves, or an ability which lets them do their job effectively. For example, Urshifu is strong because it has a broken ability, great stats, and an absurd signature move. That's why it's on so many teams. But Pelipper is strong because despite its stats, it has access to Drizzle, Tailwind, and Wideguard, allowing it to enable its partners to do their jobs better. Or Clefairy, who despite not being a fully evolved Pokemon, is used over Clefable in VGC because of its ability Friend Guard, which cuts the damage on partner Pokemon to three quarters, while also having great support moves like Icy Wind, Helping Hand, and Follow Me. Yes, in their original generations, Pelipper and Clefairy were were extremely weak, but over the years they received buffs that make them more viable nowadays. For this video, we're gonna find the Pokemon that got left behind. Pokemon who serve almost no competitive purpose, even after all those years of buffs and moveset updates. Pokemon like... Okay, so Generation 1 isn't exactly known for its early route Pokemon aging well. As a matter of fact, rather than giving these Pokemon permanent buffs in Generation 6, many of Gen 1's Pokemon just received Mega Evolutions. This would be fine and dandy if it weren't a temporary bandage for the problem, as Megas don't exist outside of Generation 6 and 7. Well, with Legend Zaza coming out, there's a solid chance that we might see them return in Generation 10. See my video about Mega Evolutions to get my opinion on that. But the point is, Beedrill used to have a Mega which solved its little viability issue by making it the ultimate glass cannon with an absurd speed stat, great attack, and amazing ability and adaptability. But with the Beedrillite mined out of existence, we're left with just base Beedrill, who has... Well, those are certainly stats. 90 attack, 75 speed, frankly pitiful bulk. Well, we can hope that its moveset and abilities will make up for this, right? Beedrill has two abilities. Swarm, an ability which boosts bug moves when it's at low health, and Sniper, an ability which causes critical hits to deal 50% more damage than usual. The best you can do with Beedrill is run a mediocre crit set with scope lens and focus energy to hit Pokemon with a nasty critical hit off that massive... 90 attack stat, okay. Yeah, dude, that poison jab is gonna almost two-shot something, maybe. It does have a few interesting tools that it could use in doubles in Tailwind and Focus Sash plus Endeavor, but so does Whimsicott and like a ton of other Tailwind Pokemon. Beedrill just really doesn't accomplish anything better than any other Pokemon. And in a generation which is home to Farfetch'd and Onix, yeah, it's impressive to be this weak. Beedrill without a doubt is the weakest Gen 1 Pokemon. As for Generation 2, we have quite a bit to discuss. Gen 2 isn't exactly known for its high power level. Most Gen 2 Pokemon required an evolution down the road to make up for their years of mediocrity. In Gen 4, we got evolutions to Piloswine, Murkrow, Gligar, Sneasel, Yanma, Togetic, Porygon 2, and Apom. And in Gen 9, we got two more evolutions to Stantler and Dunsparce. And they really needed these evolutions to make these lines of Pokemon relevant. If there were a color that accurately represents the aggression level of Gen 2 Pokemon, it'd be beige. So when I tell you that it's hard to pick the weakest Gen 2 Pokemon, I'm being dead serious. For me, it was between two Pokemon who are notably bad. The runner up here has to go to Sunflora. For a long time, Sunflora was a really underwhelming grass type, which had pretty bad bulk, low speed, and not very strong moves. 
But as time went on, Sunflora got somewhat stronger with it gaining access to high power grass moves like Leaf Storm and gaining solar power as a hidden ability. Ironically, Sunflora can actually nuke something with Terra Grass Life Orb Leaf Storm in the sun. I'm not joking, run the calcs, that thing can take lives. Even though Sunflora received very few direct buffs, it wasn't left in the dust of power creep. A Pokemon that time seems to have forgotten though is Ledian. Oh Ledian, why has your god abandoned you? Let me break it down for everyone. Ledian is a bug flying type, one of the worst defensive type combinations, being weak to rock, ice, electric, fire, and flying moves. I'd say that Game Freak messed up by designing a defensive bug flying type, but I think that calling this a defensive stat spread is an insult to other defensive Pokemon. Look at this. 55 HP, 35 attack, 50 defense, 55 special attack, 110 special defense, and 85 speed. It's like they picked numbers out of a hat, and when they saw 110 special defense, they went, oh, let's cut all the other numbers in half, I don't want this thing to be too strong. Ledian is far too frail to be defensive, far too slow to use support moves like Tailwind and Screens, and far too weak to use its hidden ability of Iron Fist. Iron Fist boosts the power of punching moves by 20%. But when its attack stat is 35, that minimal increase in power isn't really doing much. And what punching moves are you supposed to use anyways? There are no bug or flying punching moves, so it doesn't even get a stab bonus on any of the Iron Fist moves. I'm genuinely surprised Ledian hasn't received any evolutions in Gen 4 or 9, when so many stronger Pokemon from Generation 2 were granted them. Hopefully Pokemon Legend ZA will give it one. And if you're watching this in the future, and they did, please let me know in the comments. Generation 3 is actually a pretty funny generation to discuss. For some reason in Gen 3, Pokemon decided that everything should be a mixed attacker. This is because in Generation 3, Game Freak seemed to realize that people really like battling Pokemon, and it'd be a good idea to make more than viable. But since this was still a generation before the physical special move split, a move's category was tied to its typing. For example, Absol, a dark type with an attack stat of 130, couldn't use that attack stat for any of its dark type moves since all dark moves were special. So Game Freak gave it a mediocre but passable 75 special attack stat so it'd be able to use dark moves somewhat effectively. And they did this for a ton of Pokemon. Most Pokemon, rather than being min-maxed to be better at one specific attacking role that they should fill, had stats wasted on making them mediocre mixed attackers. So Gen 3 is home to a number of decent but not particularly strong Pokemon. That being said, there are two Pokemon which stand out in the crowd of mid-bros. Spinda is a pure normal type with 60 base stats across the board, because that makes its base stat total 360. Get it? 360? Like 360 degrees? Because he spins. It's a very, it's a very, you know, high IQ joke. You might need to watch, you know, Rick and Morty and understand it. I was originally going to pick this dude as my single weakest Pokemon of the generation, because not a single one of its stats is high enough to make it better at a role than any other Pokemon. But Truth be told, it almost makes up for this by having access to a ton of great moves. It simply has enough tools that you could actually get away with running a support set with Focus Sash, Fake Out, and a bunch of annoying support moves. So what is the weakest Pokemon from Gen 3? Well, if we add 10 to each of Spinda's stats, we end up with the stat spread of another pure normal type in Cast Form. Cast Form is such a weak Pokemon. It has the same issues as Spinda in that none of its stats are high enough to outclass any other Pokemon, but on top of that, it just doesn't get many good moves. And by good moves, I mean moves that it can effectively use. Spinda has a Batman utility belt of status moves, but Cast Form was given the keys to the United States Armory without any of the skills needed to wield anything in there. Cast Form has access to Hurricane, Blizzard, Thunder, Weather Ball, Scald, Energy Ball, Shadow Ball, and tons of other valuable attacks. But as a pure normal type with only 70 special attack, how hard are you really going to be hitting things? Yes, Cast Form changes its typing with the weather, thus gaining extra power on all these moves via stab bonus. But once again, its special attack is 70. It's not hitting anything hard enough to warrant using it over any other special attacker. Its bulk also isn't high enough to tank hits nowadays, and its speed isn't high enough to click Tailwind effectively, the one useful support move that it gets. This Pokemon doesn't need an evolution, it needs a total rework. Gen 4 is actually pretty decent in terms of power level. Like I mentioned earlier, Gen 4 has a ton of evolutions of earlier Gen Pokemon that were created with the intention of giving them some semblance of competitive viability. But that being said, there are a few Pokemon from this generation that seriously struggle to hold their own. I'd say the bottom three are Carnivine, Chatot, and Krikatoon. Now, I must admit, I really like Carnivine's design. Typically, when a Pokemon sprite is just hanging in the air like that, it doesn't mean anything for the lore, like Gen 5 Ferrothorn. That bro is flying in Gen 5, but for some reason, with Carnivine, they said, no, no. Bro is actually just levitating, and they gave him that ability. I'm, I'm not joking. I checked all of Carnivine's Pokedex entries to find where it says that it can float, and it's mentioned nowhere. 
just that it binds itself to trees, but that's not levitation. And this amazing ability, which grants the user a ground type immunity, is wasted on Carnivine as its grass typing already resists ground moves. We were one step away from Rotom Fan 2.0 here, and while its stats are underwhelming, there's nothing super awful about it, so Carnivine is safe. Meanwhile, Chatot is a normal flying type with really bad stats and very little making it stand out other than its signature move, but it does have a passable special attack stat at 92 with access to Stab Boom Burst, so it does have that little niche. That leaves us with Cricketune, and the best I can say about Cricketune is it has access to sticky webs, but beyond that, Cricketune just doesn't have anything going for it. Pure Bug might be a better defensive typing than Bug plus most other typings, but this isn't a defensive Pokemon. And it isn't exactly offensive either, with just 85 attack and 65 speed. The best a Cricketune can do is set up Swords Dance and try to sweep with like, I don't know, Terra Grass Trailblaze? But its cry is pretty cool, so bonus points for that. Not enough to make it out of last place though. Ah, Generation 5. Much like Generation 7 someday, you were hated upon release, but went on to be one of the most beloved batches of Pokemon ever made. Its Pokedex is actually a lot like Gen 1, only with power creep somewhat accounted for. You know, mostly. There's a few stinkers in this deck, like Summer Body Chansey and Angry Magikarp, but they all serve some kind of niche, whether it be a Cleric to heal the team or spamming adaptability flip turn. But one Pokemon here that I struggle to even conceptualize a fix for is Swanna. Swanna was meant to be Pelipper 2, as a higher speed mixed attacking water type, but in the long run, it ended up being more of a cheap knockoff, as Pelipper would go on to receive one of the most infamous buffs of all time by gaining Drizzle as an ability. Yeah, where Pelipper has access to 50% stronger water moves, Weather Ball, and a hurricane that can't miss, Swanna gets... Sorry guys, hold on, I'm trying to find something that Swanna gets that Pelipper doesn't. Um... Oh! Alluring Voice! Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, that. Good luck setting up on Swanna, morons. It's gonna hit you with a fairy move that confuses you if and only if you set up this turn. Cower in fear. Okay, this video isn't meant to be suggesting fixes as much as it is meant to be explaining why these Pokemon aren't all that, but I think the only way Swanna could become viable in a way that's different from Pelipper is probably to give it like Dazzling or something, make it a priority blocking Tailwind Pokemon. That'd be pretty sick, you know, I'd be like Zarina too. On to Generation 6, and this is one of the smallest batches of new Pokemon we've ever received, mostly due to the introduction of Megas this generation. Those contributed to the total number of new Pokemon. Because of this, the quality of Pokemon is actually much higher across the board. If I had to choose the one that struggles the most this generation though, it'd probably be Carbink. Carbink is a rock fairy type that focuses on being a defensive wall, despite the fact that rock fairy is actually not that great of a defensive typing. Carbink also lacks any form of reliable recovery. The most it can really hope to do in doubles is enable an evasion strategy with Chansey back in generation 7, and then click stealth rocks and faint in singles. Not really much to examine here. I don't know, if it got access to a move like Recover or Moonlight, it'd probably be a little bit better, but no one would really bat an eye on it. Gen 7 offers us a much larger batch of Pokemon to analyze, with a fair number of underpowered ones. I'd wager that the bottom two this generation are Komala, a Pokemon with mediocre stats and a single viable moveset, which was taken from it in Generation 9, and Pukamuku. Now, Pukamuku is a gimmick Pokemon, which I covered in a previous video that you should check out, but its whole deal is being Wobbuffet 2.0. No damaging moves other than Counter and Mirror Coat, but where Wobbuffet has a ton of HP and low defenses to maximize the damage it returns with these moves, Pukamuku has extremely low HP and high defenses, making it really difficult to score any KOs with it unless it loses most of its HP. The few things it has going for it are its ability Innards Out, which deals the HP Pukumuku lost the turn it was KO'd and damaged to the attacker, and it has access to some form of recovery in Recover and Purify. But broadly, it's not very good, and one of the worst Alolan Pokemon. Alright, so my pick for Generation 8 is actually going to be a little controversial, but only because the supposed obvious pick isn't nearly as bad as people believe it to be. Most people, when discussing the worst Pokemon in Generation 8, would argue that it has to be Thievil, and on paper, this makes sense. Thievil is a pure dark type with pretty Pretty underwhelming stats across the board. I mean, it doesn't have a single stat above 100, and its highest stat of 92 is its special defense. But it does make up for these low stats in its ability and moveset. In singles, Choice Specs Thievil is actually pretty annoying to deal with. The Choice Specs item increases its special attack stat by 50% while locking it to a single move, and Thievil's ability Stakeout doubles the damage it deals to any Pokemon that switches in on that turn. Meaning if Thievil is threatening a Choice Specs Dark Pulse on the weakened Pokemon and the opponent decides to try to switch in a resist to tank it, that move will effectively not be resisted since it's dealing double damage. And if the Pokemon who switches in doesn't resist the attack, it's now effectively super effective. Beyond that, Thievil also has some viability in doubles as an unburdened terrain seed Pokemon with a variety of support moves like Howl and Fake Tears. So what is actually the weakest Gen 8 Pokemon? For my money, 
Grap locked. Look, it's hard out here for a pure fighting type. There's a lot of them, and each of them fill just about every role that a fighting type can feasibly do. So Game Freak decided to design this one to be a trapping fighting type. Grap lock's whole deal is that it's a grappler. By using its signature move Octolock, it prevents the target from switching out while lowering its defense and special defense at the end of each turn. But the issue is that Grap locked isn't fast enough nor bulky enough to fill this role effectively. Its low speed means it has to tank a hit before it can click Octolock and trap the opponent in, and even if it manages to pull this off, its mediocre 80-90-90 bulk isn't enough to tank the second hit. So realistically speaking, the target is always able to either switch or simply set itself free by knocking out the grab locked. Ironically, it'd be better if its points in attack were spent boosting its defenses instead, allowing for it to trap in a target, lower its defenses, protect, lower its defenses even more, recover with a bit of leftovers, and then go for the KO with Drain Punch at minus 2 defense, and heal off all of that damage. They were so close with this one, but close isn't good enough when competing with threats like Dragapult in Generation 8. And here we are in the final generation, for now. Generation 9, you already know who it is. Spide Operatives rise up, Spide Ops has finally won something the award for worst Pokemon in Paldea. I'm getting tired of this nostalgia bait. Pokemon said, look, it's been a minute since we created a Gen 2 Pokemon, and then they made Spidops. I get not wanting every Pokemon to contribute to the inevitable power creep of the franchise, but let's be real. What went wrong here? The idea with Spidops is that it's supposed to be a bulky supported Pokemon with a wide variety of moves to enable its partner Pokemon. But the issue is that it's not actually bulky, nor can it hit that hard. Look, it's not living anything that it doesn't resist, it's not outspeeding anything, and while it does have a nice little tool belt, it doesn't have anything that truly makes it stand out among other Pokemon. For singles play, obviously it has Sticky Web, but there's better Pokemon with access to this move. Hey, there's better Pokemon with access to this move on this list of bad Pokemon. As for VGC, Spidops has an interesting couple of techs, but nothing worth considering it for a serious team. Insomnia with Taunt means it can pretty reliably stop Amoongus from putting a partner Pokemon to sleep, even if Trick Room is up. Faint allows for Spidops to break Wide Guard and Protect on Pokemon to allow for partners like Calyrex Ice or Calyrex Shadow to score KOs. Struggle Bug is a pretty cool and accurate alternative to Snarl, and its signature move of Silk Trap protects it and lowers the speed of any Pokemon that makes contact with it. But for some reason, non-damaging moves like Taunt bypass it, so you know, what's really the point there? You could actually plop this gem Gen 9 Pokemon into Generation 2, barring the new moves it come with, and no one would really bat an eye at it. It struggled to do anything even back then, and it's such a shame because its design goes kind of hard. I am a true spite operative, I believe in him. We'll wrap this up with a mini tier list to determine which of these Pokemon is the worst of the worst. S tier here counterintuitively means it's just unusably bad. Let's get this done quick. In F tier, meaning it's not as bad as the rest, we have Carbink. Yes, it's a mediocre defensive mon with no recovery, but it has seen some success in certain VGC formats, and at the end of the day, it's a Stealth Rock user with Sturdy, so in singles, it's not terrible. In D tier, we have Spidops and Pukamuku. As much as I clown on Spidops, it does have sticky webs for singles and access to U-turn. Its wide toolkit for doubles also means it serves some niches, even if it's not the best at them, so you could use that low-level play and get away with it. Yukamuku does have a nice niche in being an unaware wall and completely stopping setup Pokemon in singles. While not being as splashable as other unaware Pokemon like Dondozo, it does have a job. C tier, we have Krikatoon and Swanna. Krikatoon once again is a sticky webs Pokemon for singles, but it lacks the doubles tools that Spidops has and is broadly more difficult to use in a team. And Swanna is quite mediocre, but it does have access to an okay speed stat with Stab on Hurricane and Hydro Pump, so a choice spec set in singles could work. Up in B tier is just Beedrill. B stands for B! Look, it's really bad. If you manage to pull off the setup with Scope Lens, Focus Energy, and Sniper, maybe you can do something. A tier is home to cast form. I don't care what weather you want to run it on, there's a better option. You can run a better Pokemon in nearly every situation, like you have access to Slush Rush Pokemon, you have access to Swift Swimmers, you have access to Chlorophyll. Just, there's there's really no reason to use this dude. And the absolute worst Pokemon of all time is, of course, Ledian. It's a walking contradiction. Its highest stat is its special defense, yet it can't take any hits. Its second highest stat is its speed, but at 85 it's not outspeeding much. It has an ability which enables a subset of its physically offensive move pool, but its attack stat is 35. He has no swag, he stacks no paper, and he does not ride on 24 inch chrome. Game Freak, please buff. So those were the worst Pokemon from each generation. While some Pokemon may have been worse upon the release of the generations, I think it's important to point out the Pokemon that time forgot and received very little buffs over the years to draw attention to the growing power creep of the franchise. But what do you think about my picks? Do you disagree? Let me know in the comments. 
And if you made it this far, pretend in the comments that I called something objectively strong bad, like to confuse everyone else who didn't make it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. They mean the world to me. If you want to support me any further, you can check out my Patreon page or become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button below the video. This gets you sneak peeks at future videos and even some bonus content. You also get to see your name at the end of my videos like all these lovely people. Special thanks to my most boosted supporters, Adok V, Avatar67, Halo, Invisibleish, Jordan Harridge, Pika Power, and Ranger Lance for their generous pledges. Another way to support me is to check out all the videos in the playlist on screen right now. I know you'll find something in there that you'll enjoy. I also have a second channel where I talk about the current VGC metagame trends and a Twitch channel where I stream, both of which are going to be in the description down below. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.